Hi there. So today my guest is Richard Oberhammer from um, Raleigh, North Carolina. That's right. And Richard is a uh, Richard has a theory that we're going to present today. Richard is um, retired at this point, correct? Yes. But um, but you worked primarily as a electrical engineer. I started that way and and uh, did engineering work for ten or fifteen years. And then I moved into other things, uh, building and think tank management. That's that's really so. You've had a diverse career then. I've bounced around. I've mm -hmm. I've I've always I've always been a wannabe scientist. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so this this project, this thing that I'm presenting today, has really been the most interesting thing that I've had happen in my life. And in, in all the paying roles that I've been in, I've wanted to get to this. Mm -hmm. Well, that's excellent. It's it seems like a very it's an interesting theory. Oh, first I should say that we know each other from the from the Zen in the Art of Art of Motorcycle Maintenance Meetup Group. Yes, uh, and 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 I, my 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 last name is Hammer. Like you, like you drive an L with hammer. Hammer. <laughs> yeah. So, do you want to briefly tell me your interest in? Um, Persig's work before we proceed with your presentation? Oh, well, uh, I first read that novel when uh, members of my family were reading it in the 70s, and uh, we talked about it and really enjoyed it. Um, I, you know, I remembered only parts of it, but I read it again 10 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, again, enjoyed it a lot. And so, so when I saw your somehow on YouTube, your uh, your meetup group showed up in my mm -hmm. uh, in my recommendations because I've been following Jordan Peterson and mm -hmm. Paul Vander Kay, and I guess that in, in those circles where you are, right, right. Um, I I was glad to join the the meetup group because because it's uh, it's just. It's thinking. I, I, I like philosophy and exploring. And so uh, I'm, I'm very much enjoying our, uh, our weekly meetings. Yeah, we're having a nice time going through the book, huh? We kind of go off in directions, don't we? The, the, yeah, there are so many directions that are suggested that it's kind of hard to confine the discussion sometimes. <laughs> which, is, which is okay. It's turning out great, I think. Yeah. All right, Richard, so you have a model that you've been working on for how long? Many, many years. Is that correct? Yeah, probably uh, 45 years is, you know, it, it, the, I've been, pieces have been coming together mm -hmm. um, for most of my life. Um, it could, it could be the, the starting time was when I had a job as a bioengineering research assistant. Mm -hmm. when, uh, when one of my mentors told me about the, uh, the problem of life and the second law of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that a living thing uh, seems to defy the second law of thermodynamics in that it, uh, it does you know the the the, uh, the that that law says that uh, entropy is increasing mm -hmm. always, and so yeah. there's there there could be no such thing as a uh, perpetual motion machine. Mm -hmm. a, a living thing to keep on living must draw new things in. We we call it food. Mm -hmm. It ha you know it has to keep eating or its own internal processes will eventually use up everything it's got and it will die. And um, from, from that point, I started thinking, well, how could life work? You know, what, what, what's the secret? 
and I um, I guessed, well, what what could life work by trial and error? Could it be as simple as a uh, a living thing tries things and can remember? And um, and if it if the mistakes it makes aren't deadly, then then it can then eventually it may learn enough to uh, survive in the environment it happens to be in. Mm -hmm. So if, if the resources it needs to live are in the environment and the environment is friendly enough, and if the living thing is smart enough, it can adjust its behavior in the environment to keep on making choices which imbibe enough to keep it, to keep it going. And that's, that's one of the basic theories that I work with. Um, I, I assume that living things do that. So Richard, you're now going to present your theory to us. What is the name of your theory? Uh, most often I call it the resource patterns model of life. All right. Excellent. So let's get started. I can't wait to, I can't wait to see your presentation. Okay, uh, you see my screen, do you? I do, yeah, perfect. Right. There, there's another way to describe the model right there. Life, life grows through discovery of new social rules. Uh, I've got an electrical engineering degree, a master's in business. I went to graduate school in computer science for four years. And then more recently, just 10 years ago, I got, I got a master's in economics. Mm -hmm. um, throughout well, my life. Could I ask you quickly, what made you decide to get a master's um, uh, so recently? Um, I was losing interest in my job. The, uh, the 2008 economic crash was so interesting <laughs> that I, I wanted to learn <laughs> what economists would say about it. You know, I, I had my own, I had taken economics and I'd read a lot of Austrian economics, mm -hmm. economics from a particular point of view. But I wanted to learn what would, what would mainstream economists say about what had happened in 2008. I didn't know. And I just wanted to learn that. Yeah. Um, and I was in a position to start taking classes. So I did. Wonderful. Um, here, here's one of the uh, observations that starts this way of thinking in this model. Uh, you know, I, I'm a human being, and uh, they tell me I'm a multicellular organism, which is com composed of, uh, here, here we see uh, number three, with, and then number of smaller things. My body is composed of single cells called eukaryotic cells for the most part. And, and eukaryotic cells themselves are composed of prokaryotic cells. Um, and this relates to the history of life as biologists tell it, that like uh, a billion years ago, your eukaryotic cells were the fanciest things on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, but even, you go back even further, it seems that uh, prokaryotic cells at one time were the, were the kings of, of the earth. And somehow prokaryotic, prokaryotic cells combined into eukaryotes, which somehow combined into humans. So, so we have the level we're on, which, which I call three, and then the two smaller levels. A question naturally arises, what happened before prokaryotes? And uh, that's interesting, but I don't go there much. Um, that's, I, I think, you know, the, 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 these, if this much is pretty much true, we've got a model for what's going on in our environment, in our neighborhood. And um, th this is enough to deal with. And then, then down at the bottom, I put number four, uh, pointing out that we, 
the process of organizing life continues as we humans live our lives we are organizing all the time that, that we are social animals and we are continuously forming groups which are trying to fit in and so uh th that's that's a, a way i see life i just want to say quickly that uh zero number zero is something that um that come you know that has a lot of implications doesn't it um right uh yeah yeah it or and it, yeah it's it's profound and it's physics mm -hmm. and um I, I don't think i'll get there yes i think that's the place <laughs> where we all kind of <laughs> don't know what to do with right <laughs> well there um i think uh in in one of your in one of your interviews with um What recently you interviewed, not Mary, but uh, Karen. 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 Meaning Co. Yeah. And she, I, I was, been, I've been watching her interviews with Glenn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're really good. And um, well, they don't mention Stuart Kaufman. And uh, well, the, the, there are physicists and life scientists who have theories about. <coughs> Below proteins are uh, autocatalytic sets, and and <clears throat> and, and the, the the name I think of is Stuart Kaufman, who wrote At Home in the Universe um, thirty years ago. He he talks about how. Uh, molecules can create cycles in um in in the right environment so so it's it's a it's a hint of how proteins might have formed originally but um that's that's not where i want to go so <clears throat> let me see if i can go a single page rather than the whole thing um <clears throat> Living things have to eat. Fortunately, we live in a place where there are things to eat. Um, but often the, the, the nutrients that we need are too far away or too difficult, to, too difficult to harvest to benefit any one living thing. And, and so, and, and the resources that are here appear in a, in a range of sizes, <laughs> like microscopic resources enable single cells to find, to eat. And uh, apple trees enable us to eat. Um, and, and then there are still bigger resources <laughs> like uh, Jupiter and the sun, where there's plenty of material and plenty of uh, energy that we, we haven't yet started to tap, but, but we may one day. Um, and, and the growth to use larger or more difficult resources often is beyond any one of us, but we see many examples where groups of us can cooperate to uh, to exploit a resource which had previously been out of our reach. So it, it becomes a, a challenge of information processing. If, if a whole bunch of us could do something if we were organized properly, but we're not organized properly, then then if you want to explain how it happened, you have to, you, you need to start talking about how the information is processed among the, the things that might accomplish something if they could get together. And another, another an idea, an idea that runs through this is that 
when a, when a group forms and becomes successful in many ways, the group, we, we start to see it as a single thing and, and, uh, and eventually it may, it may gain so many skills as a group that it can reproduce itself. And at that point, we just call it an, another organism or a new living thing. That's, that's almost, that's a little bit like the emergence that Glenn was talking about. Is that right? Or, um, perhaps. I, I think, um, I think the emergence he's talking about is um, when, when computer models uh, get going on uh, recursive growth into an environment things pop up that you don't expect the the things will grow um that that does seem similar in a way but i think i think it emphasizes something different it's um I, I uh, yeah, I, in, in the model I'm emphasizing, mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there are patterns of resources which living things can grow into or, or get access to, but, but, the, but the growth is limited by where the patterns are. Um, so, so the previously existing patterns of resources that were there all along determine where new and larger life forms can succeed. And uh, that's, I don't think that's quite in the kind of emergence that Glenn talks about. Um, so I, I, my favorite way of trying to make some of these points clear is to talk about uh, a, mo a model of simple life forms that I call critters. <clears throat> and you know, I think maybe this is a parable. I'm, I'm gonna, maybe I'm going to start calling this the parable of the critters, because um, although it's not exactly real, it. I think it's got a lot of lessons in it. So, so we imagine uh, some single cellular organisms that are on maybe a tabletop here in front of me. And um, they, they require both water and sugar to live. And, and, uh, and they, they are nearly starving. They're, they're hunter gatherers. They, they, they live by, <clears throat> We say that the wind blows and occasionally uh, drops little deposits of water and sugar, a few molecules here and a few molecules there, so that these critters, if they keep moving about constantly, they, they can stumble on enough water and sugar that, that a, a thin population survives. And, and I draw a critter to look like this and a drop of water and a spot of sugar to look like that. And uh, we we specify we specify certain things about the critters. <laughs> One is they have a sense area, and they can't <clears throat> they can't smell or see anything. But but if they get close to anything, well, like within this range, they can detect it and they know what it is. So it might be, a, a, it might be sugar, it might be water, or it might be another critter. Um, but that is, is pretty much all they can sense. Um, also, the, the, I wrote a computer model starting to do this stuff. And I, uh, I gave the critters an ability to know where they are in their world which is, which is uh, quite a nice sense that helps quite a bit. So they have something, a very basic ability to perceive. 
they can sense what's what they're in touch with and they can know where they are uh, on the tabletop so that and and they, and they have a memory so that in every cycle so this is when this is run as a computer model in every cycle a, a critter uh, senses the situation uh, senses its its internal state if it's hungry or thirsty and then uh, and then decides to do so, and and then looks in memory to see if there's anything helpful in memory and then it decides what to do um, I don't I, I what your question was do you remember I'll go on. So, oh, I'm sorry. I think you answered it. I was muted. I think okay. I think you answered it. I just said that it's very basic. It's just very rudimentary. Right. Um, another thing a critter can remember from this current picture, we, we see the critter in contact with a large drop of water. That's more than it could take in at one time. And so uh, we I also say the critters after they have consumed what they can take from a from a deposit, if if there's some left there, they will remember that, so that later on they could go back there, and perhaps find water if another critter had drunk it up in the meantime. So, so critters have a, a memory, and and some primitive actions they can perform. Uh, here's a picture that, uh, that I call the initial condition. Uh, we've zoomed out so that the, the critters are smaller and the spots of uh, sugar and water are smaller. So you can see that there's more distance, that the critters can move a little bit. And here I've zoomed out still further so that now the critters are the only thing we see. The, the, uh, the original spots of water and sugar that we started with are now fallen out of view. They're too small to see. But if we, you know, if we get back and we can see just the critters, this, this is what we see in a larger piece of their world. And, and that's, so that's the initial condition. And here is where we modelers begin to try to teach ourselves something. We introduce into the world into their world, a, a drop of water and, and a crumb of sugar, which are huge, just huge deposits of water and sugar, which these critters need to live. Um, and we, we say that this distance between the water and the sugar is farther than a critter can travel in its entire lifetime. So that no, and any one critter that happens to start out near the water will never need water again. And, um, and similarly for the sugar, any critter that starts near the sugar will always have all the sugar it needs. But, but the one near the sugar will still die if it doesn't get enough water. And, um, and, and now we, we give the critters a new ability. We say they can carry water or sugar, they can carry a raw material for a short distance across the tabletop and set it down again. And what I, what I hope that brings up in your mind is this next picture. Here we see what we imagine the critters could do if they could organize themselves. If, if the critters near the water would carry water toward the sugar and the critters near the sugar carry sugar toward the water, then a dense population of the critters could grow and live between the water and sugar. Um, does, does that seem right? No, any problem with that? Sorry, it's just, <laughs> I don't, I, I should be right on top of the mute. Um, no, that sounds exactly like what would happen. All right, so, um, but once again, it's, it's a problem of information processing. We, we said the critters have the physical ability mm -hmm. to do this, but do they have the coordinating ability? 
And uh, so we have to remember that these critters, they don't, they can't see. They, um, they can't, they don't know that they are a group. I mean, we humans see this thing and we imagine a group. Um, whoops. Oh, I just lost my... The critters don't even know that they are in a group. And it, it, so far in this uh, in this picture, they they still have um, only few a few abilities. Now, uh, I'll, I'll I'll pause here to say two uh, one way that the critters could achieve this would be if, in addition to giving them the ability to carry a raw material a short distance. We, if we give them two simple rules, if, if you see water on the left, carry it to the right and set it down. If you see sugar on the right, carry it, carry it to the left and set it down. If, so that if we give them rules to truck water and sugar in the appropriate direction so that it's kind of like in their instinctive behavior, then, then we would expect that uh, the critters could could advance from this state where where they're poor hunter gatherers to to this state where they have a thriving population af after the passage of enough time. So, so I that can happen with with those two simple rules that I just if we if we give those of course. The question then becomes what happens if they don't have a modeler or a god to give them the rules? How could they achieve it? And that, that remains a question. That's a good question. But, uh, and, and also, um, notice that the, that the rules that, these, that the critters need to follow are determined by the environment. And it's not, you know, if these critters have an election and, and decide they're going to decide which way to truck water and sugar, that will, that, that will be really stupid because the critters can't decide it. it it's been decided by, by the environment they live in. And uh, if, too, if, the, if the rules are broken too frequently, if, if members of that thriving community get slack about following the rules, then the whole process falls down. And, and uh, the rules might seem really simple, which they are, but it, but it sort of derives from the simplicity of the problem. I mean, we've, it's a, in a sense, in our human view, it's a simple problem that these critters have to solve. And so the rules are simple. <clears throat> um, and now, now, one thing that will happen in, if, if we get a community like this that's, that's living very well, the critters who, who are benefiting from living, this, living in this community will be able to get all the water and sugar they need with only a fraction of their time. So they won't, they won't have to spend it, all their time looking everywhere. Uh, when, when this community is working well, they, they will be wealthy and they will start to do things that uh, wealthy animals might do, such as play or write poems. Of course, they, of course they don't have language yet, but, um, but, but they, they have the capacity to experiment. They, the, the, in this picture, you can see there are still some critters outlined in the region around, which, which happens with each advance of life. I think that uh, there, you know, in in our environment around us humans, there are still single cellular organisms, which just didn't get on in on the plan of organization. Um, <clears throat> Okay, let me uh, go down 
and as I've as we've said before, when uh, when when the critters organize like this, we humans or we modelers who are talk begin to see it as a single entity. We we talk about it as a single thing, even though none of those critters has the ability to conceive of such a group. Okay, now um, now we've, we've zoomed out again and we're looking at a bigger piece of the world and we've turned it 90 degrees to put it to put it into the uh, into the picture. And we see uh, on, on the left here, we see a uh, resource pattern, water and sugar, which is occupied already and a thriving community is there. But what we ask, well, <clears throat> what if in this world, there, there is another resource pattern which has not yet been occupied. Um, and so this, this is the sort of challenge which we can focus upon if, if we're doing this modeling. We, uh, and when we're doing it as a thought experiment, we would give the critters extra powers like like there might be leader critters who can send signals to tell a group to head off to the to the new terrain of course first they'd also have to be able to sense it um, but anyhow so we we imagine that if if uh here, here we see from from the resource pattern on the left a uh, a troop of critters has headed out, had is heading in this direction. Eventually, to to land on this new continent, we might call it, where they uh, where that thin group could set up and establish a new colony. But what? Uh, it's many things that the critters would have to have many new powers of conception and organization before they could do such a thing. Um, yeah, in in this picture where we 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 humans can conceive that this would, if they could send out a an exploratory party with that many members in it, that that might be a way to, uh, to exploit the new resource. So would that sort of be, they already have powers of exploration individually. That's right. So, so would this be, um, I'm gonna use the word emergent because I don't know a better word for it, but would this be an emergent, uh, an emergence of that, that uh, individual desire to explore in the group? I mean, how would you, how would you characterize this? How would you characterize this group um, um, it, it desire might be to explore? It's, it, might, it might be, I, I would call it Darwinian more than emergent. Um, if if the wealthy critters in this established community start, it, I think first they would have to gain the ability to recognize that they are themselves exploiting a resource pattern. That, um, and, 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 then they would, and then they would have to make, make telescopes or some way of sensing or sending out scouts to, uh, to, to speculate that there's another pet to speculate or to know that there's another resource out here which which can be uh inhabited if if they get there and um if if the the wealthy critters in this community do do that science and that speculation and that philosophy about their situation and and they sufficiently come to come to believe that they can organize a party 
this, so this maybe this is a, a business an entrepreneur has done this or the or the king of spain or something uh gets this many critters together and then this this expedition might succeed or it might fail but in darwinian terms the populations which do grow philosophy and telescopes and organization which enables them to extend into a distant resource pattern, the, those populations will come to dominate the world. Um, let's see. Because let's somewhere here, here, suppose the world is like this. You see here we've zoomed out further and we see just one, one resource pattern which has been inhabited. But in fact, it's in a universe with many possibilities. So, um, Emergence, as I think of it, is is uh, something that's accomplished in in computer programs, sometimes uh, cellular automata. Um, following rules to to grow patterns, and and you've uh, no doubt you've seen the very colorful patterns of patterns within patterns. Are you talking about fractals? Yes, uh, yeah. Um, when you say emergence, you're not talking about fractals. Um, I, I think, I think there's, I think there's the there's the strong emergence that Glenn was talking about, where it's a whole new thing that that breaks off and becomes independent, and then we look at that as just one thing, and you can't uh, tell where that came from by looking at its constituent elements. But I think maybe what's happening, what, what this might be is a collection, like this expedition is the, uh, the critters plus the propensity to explore. And so it's a social pattern that's emerged, but that's weak emergence. You can tell what the elements are. You can break it down and see all the elements and, and figure out what the big pattern is from the smaller elements. And the strong emergence would be something that you can't tell where it came from from its from its uh, individual pieces. All right. Like you can't trace it back to the, to the uh, elements. Okay, I, I need to learn that use of the word emergence. Um, you know, just from generically, I'd say yes. This this group emerges from that group. Um, but um, so what a, a point I'm making here is that working together in groups sometimes is is necessary not you know not only to <clears throat> not not only to exploit the first resource pattern but to proceed out into life to exploit other resource patterns <clears throat> and the uh let's see in, in the next picture i say what if what if um in this situation what, what if there were clans or family groupings you know and i've i've drawn red ovals around things that we might call clans or tribes which tend to hang together and which uh, which trust each other within the clan so that they can they, <clears throat> so that the, the clan as a whole can uh, can do some things and if 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 originally we started with something like this where there were clans of critters then then it wouldn't take a, a combination of 50 critters that have to be organized, but we see that the two biggest clans 
can pretty much do it themselves. If, um, if there are already working subgroups, then those subgroups might be able to cooperate um, to exploit a resource pattern. And so this is, um, and I'm, I'm claiming that this is, this is about life. This, yeah, yeah. this happens to us humans. So you're saying that when you develop these social patterns of, um, of these clans or groups, then these social patterns uh, less of like make less members stronger than the individuals. Like you you get the same effect with less with less critters when you have these social patterns. Um, yeah, these these uh, clans aren't themselves big enough to exploit the big new resource pattern. But acting acting together as groups, they may be able they may be able to. Well, if if the resource pattern was closer together, then a single clan could do it all. What what I want to show with this is that if if the world is like this, then there are advantages in forming clans. Uh, like in the previous slide, the, these these critters in this clan ha have an advantage already in that they might come together to exploit the larger resource pattern. So, so I'm saying that given that we are in a world in which there are resources beyond our reach as individuals, it behooves us to form in-groups, to form groupings, companies or clans or families or uh, political parties. Um, and, and if these clans can hold together, then, then the whole, then it might work. So, so I'm saying that the, we, we may expect that Darwinian evolution has built into us a, a bias to be clannish and, and that the, the reward of being clannish might be that we, we fall into a situation where our clan can, or can singly or in combination with another clan can, can dominate. So I think that's that's a point that comes out of this, and it's it's kind of physical. It's not you know this isn't touchy feely psychology. This is this is almost physics. Okay. Um, so that there there is a oneness. The where, where there is an environmental resource that might feed a bunch of living things, then we might find an organization or a set of organizations which, uh, which are adapted to exploit those things. And the members of those organizations have to follow certain rules of behavior or what I've more recently started calling uh, behavior patterns. to exploit the resource. So <clears throat> uh, it's, I just got a little dialogue said I was unmuted, but I, I I'm sorry, I, I meant to unmute myself. I just okay. wanted to say number two is interesting because in terms of, um, you know, we we're talking about Persig that want is, you know, that is, is value. Yes, yeah. yeah. Maybe it's quality, I, I don't know. Um, and, and that's, um, of course, that's what they call teleology. But I think, I think that's, it's okay in this science to talk that way, um, where, 
I, generally, I assume Darwinian evolution is, uh, is useful and close enough that I, I kind of assume, yeah, stuff like that, that's right. Um, so it could be the organizations don't want it, but, but, the, but the organizations that act as if they want it come to dominate. And so, um, so we who are at a distance might talk about them as wanting it. So uh, each, each is, um, here, here's the word sustainable. And uh, in this theory of life, uh, we, we can exist because we have discovered and are exploiting concentrations of energy and raw materials. And each, each environmental resource is finite and will be expanded with continued use. But, <clears throat> We, we prosper by finding new uh, new patterns of behavior and new resources. And that's why, you know, that's why we're, we're so much better at finding new patterns of behavior to exploit new resources that, um, that, <clears throat> that we're doing better than ever before. In fact, we haven't, we haven't hit the bottom as, as many, uh, many environmentalists would be very concerned that we're using up a finite resource. And it's always true, every, every resource is finite. But there, there was an economist named Julian Simon who wrote a book called um, The Ultimate Resource, in which he says the ultimate resource is the human mind or our inventiveness. And, you know, so, so we, humans who consider ourselves to be at the top of the pile of life are doing very well because of our ingenuity, our continual moving on to exploiting new resources. Do you think that that's a factor that's left out in the, um, in the narrative about, about in the, in some of the environmentalist narratives is the, uh, the new ways of finding, let's just say new technologies tend to be disregarded and the more um, biological, physical model of resources tends to be emphasized? Yes. Um, you know, there, there, there are free market environmentalists. And, and incidentally, the, uh, I wanted to say about Bozeman, Montana, that uh, one thing I know about that is that uh, that is where there's an institute called PERC, which, um, which is a bunch of libertarian economists uh, who, who do, um, who, who write books and policy reports about environmentalism from a, uh, from a free market perspective. <clears throat> so that's, I, I just, you know, with with uh, Robert Persig writing so much about Bozeman, I that that's been in the back of my mind that that's where Perk is. Well, one thing Persig said is one thing that uh, is is like some of these ideas, you know, environmentalism, uh, the the standard narrative. It's a very moral narrative, but it's it's um, it's it's not dynamic enough. Like um, you know, it's it's more intellectual. There's an intellectual idea that that uh, in theory we could do this and and you know decrease our carbon footprint, but in reality, it's not it's not when you enforce it, all these things fall apart because it's it's enforced top down. And you need something more dynamic that works with the way things actually are, rather than the way we idealize them. Right. Yeah, that's. Uh, 
uh, in uh, in this situation, the critters have to carry water one way and sugar the other way, and uh, any any other pattern of behavior that you suggest might might just not work at all. Um, which is something like what you just said, I think. <laughs> So there are um, patterns of behavior which, uh, which need to be discovered. And one, um, one result that comes out of this model of the critters is that a population may be thriving, but not yet have developed an awareness of the resource pattern it is tapping. Um, I, I think the first, I think the critters make that clear. That, that's one thing I'd like to come out of the parable of the critters, is that these, these, uh, these critters are flourishing, but, but they don't even know that it's because they're, they are behaving in a particular way in a particular environment. Um, and and their continuation or their expansion into a, a richer life or, or more, pop, more settlements would, would require them to come to understand why it was they were flourishing. Okay, um, so far there's no morality in this model. Uh, one, an environmental resource that a, a group of critters might exploit might be other critters. Um, in, in, in the chapter on public psychology that I'm drafting now, uh, some of the critters become cannibals and, and they, they discover that they can team up and gang up on other critters and eat other critters. Um, now I want to, th there's another, in, in the first challenge, which looks like this, and which can become this, I, th there's another way that the critters can accomplish this. I, I said, give them simple rules, carry water to the right, carry sugar to the left, and then it'll be done. Another way that it can happen is if we give each critter an ability to negotiate with another critter. If, um, if, 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 so we give them a simple language that says, I'm, I'm willing to trade. Uh, I will give you five water for two sugar. What do you say? And, and, and so if, if, there's, if each critter has a protocol, it can follow so that, uh, so that two critters that meet can negotiate a mutually beneficial trade, then this could happen. Uh, I have not explained that or developed that. Well, if, in chapter five, I, I developed that more completely. But does, do, do you believe that? I think you muted both of us, uh, and now you are still muted. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time with this. <laughs> so you're saying that in order to um, to develop a morality, you would have to you would have to somehow they would have to. Now the, you said something about learning, so they would have to learn that the, that this immediate, uh, like for example, cannibalism in the long run won't work. 
That, that's right. Can cannibalism eventually kills it. So mm -hmm. if we if we trust Darwin, uh, cannibalism, the impulse to cannibalism mm -hmm. will be limited. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm saying a, another way that critters can establish this thriving community mm -hmm. is is if they can trade, if they can just negotiate critter to critter trades. Right. And um, then, then it will turn out that overwhelmingly, the you know the the best behavior will be carrying water one way and sugar the other. They 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 will discover yeah this trade route. Um, and that that's that's probably a more likely scenario for the for the development of this one thriving community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the first one I gave you where like God just told them carry yeah, water. This yeah. is, uh, so uh, down here further, I um, so the, the, yeah, this is about you know settling into mutual mm -hmm. trade, right? If, if we avoid hurting or cheating our trading partners, uh, then, then a, a population of us, you know, Darwin will reward the population of us yeah, that, yeah. That, uh, that behave that way. Right, so morality emerges from becoming more sophisticated in terms of, um, in terms of exploiting resource patterns. Um, yeah, but yeah, but they don't. The critters don't have to know they're exploiting resource patterns. The critters only have to learn to treat each other respectfully, and and in in to to carry out trades mm -hmm. and and just honorably complete a trade as as agreed. Mm -hmm. Then, then critters that do only that will align themselves without intending to do so. Right. Uh, between the water and sugar. So there's a moral law that emerges that if you follow it, you're going to be provided for. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you will do better mm -hmm. in, in the long run. Let's see. Can I, can I ask you uh, that last slide? What do you mean by unconscious? So, so when you, so that was what you meant by unconscious. Yes, the uh, what what we humans see as as the organization between water and sugar. Mm -hmm. None of the critters are conscious of that organization. Right, but they no. are, but they are conscious of these rules of these law of this morality. They become conscious of this morality and they understand that when they follow this morality, they are provided for, but they are not conscious as to how this morality mediates their behavior to, to get the resources. Uh, sort of, but, but I would say they're, they, they, just, they, they just follow rules. They, don't, they can follow, <clears throat> Consciousness of following rules mm -hmm. would come after following rules. Mm -hmm. uh, so the critters don't don't have to be conscious of the fact that they are following rules, mm -hmm. just as long as they do. Right. Um, yeah, that's that's what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if, if life has grown, as biologists suggest, and, and if my model captures some of that, then we might see what we call interlevel learning. Like, um, if, if we want to ask, how, how did single-celled organisms start to organize themselves you know, in, into couples and into groups and into clans and, and eventually into larger and larger groupings that succeeded. We might get hints by looking at 
we, we conscious humans might examine our own social habits mm -hmm. and behaviors to see how we form groups. Mm -hmm. um, so if, we're, if biologists are trying to build models of the formation of the first primitive multicellular organisms, they might learn from looking at humans organizing groups. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I mean by interlevel learning. I, I'm not sure it's true. Well, it's, it, sounds, <laughs> it sounds like it could be. That's a really interesting thought. Yeah, because it's, it's a problem of information processing. Mm -hmm. It's, um, um, and, uh, with the critters in that first model between water and sugar, they, they can they can grow to that order, to that organization without ever perceiving the water and sugar, as I've said. Um, and and a, 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 con a consequence of that is the, if, if, if the, well, to the extent that that group does become operational as a group, it means that it, it has grown certain information processing capabilities that, that, uh, apparent, that I think must be centralized. There might be some super smart critters who just every, all the other critters trust, or there might be critters like neurons that have mm -hmm. feelers into all the critters. Well, maybe you could say that because all, we came from these single cell critters or these very simple critters, that there's vestiges of that, you know, there's a, there might be a, a cellular memory of that. So it makes sense that, you know, it's still in there somewhere, even though we're multiple billion, you know, how, I don't know how many cells. And that, and that if we look at our, it, it would make sense that our social behavior might you know, might follow some of those patterns and exactly what you're saying that if we look at our social behavior, it would make sense that way back it came from that. And if we're trying to figure it out, if we're trying to reconnect, let's say, um, with our earliest biology, it would make sense to look at ourselves first as a, as a hypothesis as to how um, they might be organizing. Yes, um, <clears throat> what you say makes perfect sense. But I've, I've, I've kind of gone in a different direction. Okay. Uh, in that, um, if, if the, the big men in the group or the, the big, the, if, if a group of critters can be organized any way, any, any means of organization, then the, the organizing uh, information processing is, is a new thing. It's emergent. It, the, um, it comes to be in a situation where it wasn't before because there's a circumstance in which this information processing, this new, new form of management can live. And it can live independent of what all the individual critters know. So, so that a, an information processing capability that enables a group of critters to send a, an exploratory party to another possibility, might that, that sophistication of information processing might be achieved, you know, independent of what all the critters know about how to scavenge to survive as individuals. So in a sense, it's, so the, in my human being, the lower levels are, oper, are, are operating and, and it's possible that there is no communication or very little between the lower levels that run my stomach and, and the higher levels that uh, form my sentences. Yeah, so that's, I, you know, I, and 
And given that, uh, given that eukaryotic cells seem to have been so sophisticated in their ability to organize that, uh, that they created us uh, organisms with, uh, with sexual reproduction. Um, we humans aren't near that smart yet, you know, in, in how we organize. It could be that eukaryotic cells in their means of organization are much more sophisticated than we are. So you so then you're saying that if we study these these um, these uh, simple cellular um, organisms, we might learn something as to how we can improve. Oh yes, it, yeah, or how, how we can eat better. Mm -hmm. You know, it depends on what you mean by improve. Uh, what 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 do you think the implication is of this for us? It, um, it says a great deal about our minds. Uh, uh, it, my, my mind has grown for the purpose of helping an organization achieve certain things. And um, and I have survived because the organization could achieve those things, but but there are many things that the organization may never need, and and therefore may not be in my mind, mm -hmm. like truth. Mm -hmm. um, you know what what I um, I mean absolute truth. I mm -hmm. I form hypotheses as I am deciding how to act. My brain processes hypotheses and selects one, but it's only a hypothesis. Um, and hopefully, you know, I, I, I'm lucky enough that I'm 99.99% sure of every hypothesis that guides my action whenever there's any danger. Mm -hmm. But um, so this, this says a great deal about the mind of any one of us. And, and also our social connections about how we, since we're living in like in that rich community of critters uh, where there's, uh, there's wealth for research and experimentation, um, this model says a lot about what we should expect of our social instincts. And, and it says why people form groups that, it, you know, the groups that seem illogical to us. Mm -hmm. um, another part of this is that the, uh, the resource patterns which we may successfully exploit may not be within our range of perception. In fact, there, there may be, it may happen quite often as life grows, mm -hmm. that individuals or groups of us succeed in feeding ourselves from something that we, we, don't, we can't even see. Right. Well, in, in your writing, you said in the 18, you know, in the 18th century compared to now, there is so much that they did not see that we see and we take for granted. And, and it's fair to say that, you know, a hundred years from now, there will be all sorts of things that we never saw that we see then. Right. And, and you don't, and unless you, if you don't see it, you don't know it's there, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, some some biases our our tendencies to be clannish. Mm -hmm. um, while while that uh, many people see that now as being morally repugnant. Uh, in this model, it seems uh, 
there are rewards for certain clans. They, it's a, you know, well, if, if not every clan will succeed, some of them will just have the wrong idea. Like, uh, I think up, up here, I said, what, what if there were family groupings? Yeah. See, down, see, see down here, yeah. here's a clan that's just got, it's not going to be any good. That's right. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> So this, this model delimits the information processing that helps life work. And, and my brain is one of those information processing systems. And also my social networking and all of our social networks are, are figments or are fragments of uh, information processing systems the success of which will be judged by the, uh, the cold physical rules of our environment. And so it's not, it's not a model, in a sense, it's not a moral model, but, but we can see places in the model where morality will succeed. So this, this model creates environments where we, we could tweak the parameters and show where cannibalism would pay off. But, but by another tweaking of the parameters, we can create settings in which clearly mutual love will pay off. And, uh, to the extent that it's true, I hope it will be used for good. <laughs> um, but it's, um, in a sense, it's just a cold phys physicalist theory about where we are in life. And, and it starts with, um, I think the, the founding postulates, I call them, are, are pretty reasonable. You know, life grows in levels. Life has to eat. And what, what living things must get to eat are around us in the environment in, uh, in ways that can be discovered. That's why I call it patterns. Because we, we, we can discover how to behave, but we can't decide how to be well we can decide how to behave in a way but only certain behavior patterns will be rewarded by the environment that makes a lot of sense so uh and and many of the patterns which can be exploited can be exploited by groups of us so so it yeah, I think I think that all makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so I think what you're saying is we shouldn't be so quick to disparage groups or clans because it might be only in that way that we're going to be able to see some of these patterns. I think we should see them for what they are, like you know, like some. Um, so some value systems uh, disparage sexual attraction or sexual activity, but learning biology, we uh, we have a different attitude towards sex. We don't we don't see it as evil, or we you know we see it as part of life. And uh, I would I would hope that we could come to see our clannishness similarly as something that influences us strongly but has a place in, in life. And uh, so we, we can manage it uh, within limits. Would you say in general, as a society, you know, as a 21st century society, Western society, we, we really have a tendency to look at the physical and, and the intellectual and ignore the social. Like we, we tend to um, denigrate like not see the social level as important as it actually is. 
and we're trying to make some kind of connection between it. You know, we're trying to mold the world from, from the lower levels, you know, the, um, we're trying to like, like atomistic theory would say, everything can be, you know, traced back to atoms. And we're really ignoring the fact that you have the soul social level in here that's responsible for so much. Yeah, I think you're right. We're, um, we're, we're, we're inadequately aware of the benefit of our social instincts. And, um, and, in, and inadequately aware of, of the hard physics which, uh, which justify our tendency towards social attitudes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, I've about said what I was on the, was in the program. Um, there was one last slide that it was co-centric. Was that part of the? Probably. Uh, I put down here some slides that I thought I might get to. Uh -huh. um, this, this is a slide that I used in chapter five where I was developing the idea that uh, the critters could discover a trade route between the water and the sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, this. We, uh, in region A, close to the water, the, the critters will never, though they have all the water they want. Right. You know, they will never want for sugar. But as we get further away into region B and region C, we get, uh, we get critters that, uh, that probably, have, probably have enough water, but, but they're more likely to stumble onto sugar. Um, <clears throat> So th this is kind of a a price gradient. Mm -hmm. The closer you get to the to the water, the the lower the price of the water. Right, that makes sense. So you're still you're still working on this theory, you know. You've well, I've I've got an outline for a book, and, uh -huh. and uh, I've been lingering working on chapter six for about three years now, mm -hmm. which is public psychology. Um. I think I, I think that the stuff I've presented today should make some people want to research this more on their own. Yeah. I, I um, but I, to my knowledge, that hasn't happened. So. Uh, well, you you probably need a, a you know you probably need a broader platform. Yeah, and, and maybe a way to focus. There there are. Uh, Some of the conclusions that are that I think are important can be derived from a subset of the whole of of all the postulates. Mm -hmm. um, for for instance, the first the first the first critter model between the water and sugar doesn't need life and levels. I think that that works. You you, you can use that to say. Uh, groups can achieve things that individuals can't. Right. And and the rules of behavior within those groups can't be decided by election or by by philosophers or yeah. uh, it's 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 just a raw fact of the environment. It just it just happens. It it it, right. it, it develops. So so why don't you give us some? Um, all right. So this is this has been really great seeing you know like. I've read, I read it, but to have you explain it makes much more sense. Um, what is your, as you're going on with this, what is your hope? What, what is your hope for the contribute, um, that this would contribute to our society? Oh, I, I would, uh, I would hope that, that we could manage ourselves more intelligently seeing seeing our group instincts um, in 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 the way many of us people have been educated to see sex mm -hmm. not not a not a dirty or sometimes bad thing but just 
um, instincts that have been evolved into us. And, yeah, and 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 if we and if we can see it, to you know, um, in my philosophy chapter, one one of the uh, one of the assumptions I outline is prosperity is good. P I G. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I'm 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 assuming that that, that we modelers of life are glad when we can show how the critters can get water and sugar and make a thriving community. And, and I'm assuming that, that it would be good if we humans continue to do better, to live richer lives and to uh, probably that means expanding into the universe. I, I, I am, it's my, uh, supposition that that's good but i don't have any proof of that <laughs> well it's, it's, ha it's happening right now huh <laughs> right it's starting to so so i think that if if this model of life is understood in general we can become more intelligent about how we mm -hmm. organize and and do research mm -hmm. um, And, and we can understand our own minds much better. Uh, you know, the, all the, the philosophy of language, I think, um, I think this has a different philosophy of language in that uh, the, the mind of any one of us is, is like one of, the, one of those critters Uh, the first, maybe the first language is, is what I, is a trade. Mm -hmm. I give you this, you, you know, and, and, uh, if, if a trade works, it's, uh, it's, and it's not perfect. I think the, the, the positivist inclination to find perfection in uh, in meaning or you know crystal clear meanings don't don't talk until you can define everything perfectly yeah. <laughs> or be a little bit difficult and also i think carl popper i, I don't know uh, martin in our group talks about falsifiability mm -hmm. i don't know if you know that i think i associate that word with carl popper and his i his understanding of scientific method um I don't know enough about it. Okay. But we, we, we shouldn't expect that our theories are perfect mm -hmm. or can be. So that if, but if they're, if they're good enough, if they're useful, then that's a good thing. Right. Yep. Well, thank you, Richard. This is a wonderful presentation. Thank you for your interaction. And I, I hope I can get, uh, helpful questions and, and uh, you know, I, I continue working on it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and when you have a, when you have an update, let's, you know, let's do this again. Yeah. Well, some okay. Additional reflections, you know, let's go for it. Right. So, I'm, I'm daily. I have <laughs> I see new things, uh, new things come together for me about, uh, I've just, just during the last six months, maybe I've thought of information processing. Well, maybe, maybe you need a, maybe it's time for you to have a YouTube channel. Yep. Um, They're really good for helping you sort things out because you get so much, you get so much good feedback and that's what I've so much enjoyed about yeah, mine. Right. Um, yeah. So far I've been, I've, I, I have focused on finishing the draft of a book of getting, I understand. <laughs> getting everything said once yeah. <laughs> uh, and then see what follows. But, but you know, if I could uh, launch into YouTube and get some, some helpful interaction, that would, that would be wonderful. It's, it's a good community. You know, you really, I think it is good for getting uh, feedback and interaction. We don't need to be stars. We just need to find 
like-minded individuals. And that's one thing it's really good for. Well, you're giving me a model that I might <laughs> copy. All right, Richard. Well, thank you very much for coming on here. Thank you, Sabula. And I will see you tomorrow. All right.